to you all. Good morning. How many of you are just on the other side of all that flu deliciousness? <laughs> many, yeah, yeah. It's good to have us in recovery. <laughs> so January has been the month where we began the topic in looking at the idea of gestation. Anybody for extra credit remember the four steps of gestation that we talked about in that, that first Sunday? Number one was inception. That's easy for everyone because inception is the beginning of the thought, the beginning of that creative idea which happens to us continuously over and over and over again. Conception follows is where you and I began to put some action to that idea. I asked you to reflect upon and to consider the fact that if the idea lands in your mind, the ways and means for that idea to find realization have also been sitting in the soil and then in the fertility of your infinite potentiality. After that is the, the juicy part, the gestation. That's where I want what I want when I want it. <laughs> uh, rears its ugly head for us and we realize that there is a process to this realization and everybody's process is different it's uniquely designed regarding to where we are in terms of our own self-awareness but ultimately the final step of realization is getting to the understanding and the awareness that what you desire that first step which was what inception the moment that the inception materializes and comes forth within our awareness, unilaterally, at the same time, the realization of that thing is already there. So we say it how? We say solution already exists. We say that that hungering and that craving for some improvement regarding your creativity or your respect with regards to the way in which you do your work in the world, that workplace, what? already exists. It doesn't have to be formulated from scratch. And so what takes place then between inception and realization is everything. It says everything about who we are. It says everything about our attitudes and about our congruency in being that open channel, that vessel for the divine to particularize <laughs> and individualize itself as us. It says everything about us. And the amazing part, too, is that we are always teachable and we are always children and we are always studying and we are always being beckoned to return back to beginner's mind. I discovered that I'm not a really good sick person. <laughs> and so... Um, the realization that there's something other than the sneezing and the coughing and the runny nose is hard to imagine when you're in the midst of that, right? And so much more that affects us in a, in a global way. How many of you have ever skipped a stone or tried to skip, skip stones across a, a pond or a lake? And so we're taught what about that practice? That the harder that you throw it, and the farther that the stone goes, and the faster that the stone goes, that's success. And yet that same idea or that same process do, does not fit um, our spiritual awareness and our spiritual growth because it isn't about trying to get from inception to realization as fast as we can. It isn't about trying to hurdle or create spiritual bypass or not looking at what it is that creates upset or anything within us that brings about a darker thought process or anything that brings about fear and anxiety because we all have that, correct? None of us in this room are exempt from having those thoughts of anxiety and frustration and fear. It doesn't mean that we're doing it wrong. It means that in this spiritual experience, we are having pockets of human emotion. And that's totally, totally doable. So the goal isn't, the success isn't to get to realization really fast. It's to be able to take the stone which before now and the way in which the world has instructed us to, to get there as quickly as possible but to rather take the stone and just let it drop. Just let it drop in the water and let it sink. 
And it is in the sinking of that that we reach this place called a vulnerability. And we are so afraid of vulnerability. And yet it's vulnerability where the genesis of a strength yet, yet uncovered, a strength yet not defined or expl fully explored is waiting for us. So we say, we, we love Brene Brown, we love the topic of vulnerability, but boy, when it shows itself up for us, we want to move to realization as fast as we can. <laughs> None of us want to sink down into the pond or to the, the algae-filled bottom of that lake. But you know what? There's some treasure there. There are some things that we have yet to examine with regards to what subjectively or subconsciously is getting in the way. And I couldn't be more excited today to have our beautiful friend Mona Shai Joshi back for us. She's a part of our spiritual council for 2018. <laughs> to talk about this pathway to change. Change is in the gestation part, right? Change is the thing that, you remember the joke, when one door closes, another door opens, and we go, yes. And then the other part, but the hallway is a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> gestation is the hallway, right? <laughs> and who better to get us through the hallway with some guidance than Mona? Just a little bit. Um, um, I love Mona and I, I love her origin and her work. Mona is the, the right arm for the Atlanta chapter of the world's largest humanitarian organization, The Art of Living. She works side by side with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. She's been very helpful to me and I'm just so glad that you're here today. Thanks. Thank you, David. Yes. So the path of change, the hallway, the gestation, what have you uncovered that you can tell these people in order to, to not, not condemn themselves mm -hmm. for anything or any misstep along the way? Just out of curiosity, since it's January, it's a new year, how many of you took an intention or made a resolution or had a vision, made a vision board or even had an idea of what changes you would make for yourself this year? It's now January 21st. It's now the period in which we say, screw it. <laughs> Self-acceptance, that's where it's at, right? <laughs> that's the word for 2018. You know, we have such an interesting relationship with change. One perspective we can take with change is some people feel that life is stagnant and they're ready to make changes a new job, a new partner, a new personality overhaul, whatever it might be. And that idea is that change is good. Change will lead to something. Then there's some people who are resistant to change, even scared of change. Now, could there be a third perspective of someone who's not restless for change nor resistant to it? This third perspective I would consider quite wise. It's a person who says that everything is changing. But within that realm that everything is changing, there's something inside which is non-changing. Have you ever met an old friend, maybe from high school or college, and thought to yourself, man, they've aged? <laughs> <laughs> it happened to me. I, was, I reconnected with a dear high school friend on Facebook. And I was going through her pictures and saying, wow, that's so sweet. She's posted so many pictures of her mother. <laughs> oh my God, that wasn't her mother. <laughs> Boy, she's changed. <laughs> and it's easy for us to see the change in others. And the reason we can do that is because even though we're changing ourselves, constantly, there's something within us that's non-changing. And when we establish ourselves in that non-changing aspect of ourself, then we can move through change with greater ease. Well, how did you phrase it? You said, until we have a relationship or a security with that which is 
non-changing, then the part that does change will always be fearful, will always be trepidatious. Our, our skill comes from understanding that there is a part of us that does not change, that source. There is a word in Sanskrit called viveka. Viveka means discrimination. And it's discrimination looking at our life and examining what is short-term, what is long-term. What is permanent, what is impermanent. What is temporary, what is not. And when we look at that aspect within our life, we see that everything is changing, but there is something that's non-changing. And then the more we reside in that which is non-changing, the self, the spirit, the soul, the more we can navigate change with greater ease. And it doesn't throw us. The more we then welcome change itself. And so another word would be <coughs> certainty and uncertainty. Certainty and uncertainty. So you're saying that there is a part of us that is certain. Would you agree that there is a part of you that is certain? And what is that part? The divine. The divine. Yes. What, what are other words that we use? God, all, source. Can you, intellectually, you, you'll nod your head, but the real juice here today is what is your relationship with certainty? Because the relationship or the degree that you have a relationship with that which is certain colors and influences how you navigate through uncertainty. Do you get the point? And everything is predicated then on that. And uncertainty shows up on our doorstep then every single day. Every single day. Actually, every single moment. Do you know what's going to happen in the next five minutes? Or even how our mind is going to react to the next sentence that's being said? It's so uncertain. And that's something we've been carrying with us, our own mind, since we took our first breath. And yet it's still so uncertain. There's such instability there. Now, speaking of certainty and uncertainty, my husband and I were traveling to India and we were going to go to Bangalore to the Art of Living Retreat Center there. We had booked our tickets three months in advance. When we got to India, we found out two days before this flight from a friend, not the airlines, that our flight was canceled. They offered to reroute us. So what would have been an hour and 40 minute flight took us close to eight hours we made stops in three different cities. But the journey was such an interesting process. At every stop, they gave us a hot snack, a delicious Indian hot snack. Then the last stop was in the city of Goa, which is a beautiful resort city. And I got to meet my favorite uncle, who picked us up from the airport, took us to the beach, took us to those beautiful old Portuguese churches that are in Goa. We had a homemade lunch at my aunt's house. We saw everything that we could possibly see in Goa in a span of two hours. <laughs> we had so much fun, my husband and I, throughout this entire journey that we arrived in Bangalore, not tired, but with huge smiles on our faces. You know, life is full of uncertainty. Life is a combination of certainty and uncertainty. And when we live in a place that's so comfortable and so stable, or at least it was until last year, <laughs> we... <laughs> we've become vulnerable to that which is changing. It becomes uncomfortable for us. A contrasting airline experience, I was once flying to Chicago. Two weeks before the flight was going to take off, the airline called me to tell me that my flight would be delayed 30 minutes. Contrast. Such a contrast. <laughs> Versus a, another time in which my husband landed at an airport in, New in Bombay, in Mumbai. And he had a flight to catch, and he arrived in time. And then he found out that the flight had already taken off. <laughs> that they use, that they did what in India is called prepone the flight, which is the opposite of postponing the flight. <laughs> <clears throat> I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> Wait till you hear 
how early they preponed it. So a flight that was supposed to take off at 7 p.m., passenger shows up at 6 p.m., the flight actually took off at 7 a.m. that morning. <laughs> so when we start making comfort with the uncertainty, then we gain more confidence. We're able to welcome that. You know, when things are certain, things are definitely stable. But they're also predictable. And it can bring up boredom. It can bring dullness. And when things are uncertain, sure, there's chaos involved, but there's also excitement. There's a thrill. And when you're in a chaotic situation, that's when your skill sets come up. And how do we develop those skill sets? How, how do we, how do we um, <clears throat> instead of running away from uncertainty or doing everything within our power to create all of this resistant energy, how do we run towards it? You know, I think there's certain steps we can follow. One would be swadhyaya or self-study. And just looking at how we deal with change. Looking back in your life, how have I processed change over the years? Was I welcoming of it? Was I resistant? I mean, the changes in your life, so we're calling this month metamorphosis. Have you read um, the metamorphosis? So Gregor Samsa, in the very first paragraph of that novella, wakes up as an insect. That's not something we probably have to deal with. <laughs> we just have to process the changes we get on a daily basis. And self-study is such a useful tool there. Let's, shall we do something right now? OK. So turn to someone whom you don't know. And just form a dyad, a partnership with that person. Now what we'll do, OK, don't talk yet. Don't talk. Wait for the instructions. Go ahead and get it out of the way and say, my God, you're good looking. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, and now. Okay, listen to Mona. Listen to Mona. So now, person, one person will be A. Just raise your hand, whoever's A, and the other person's B. A. A will list off you get a minute and a half. That's it. We'll, we're timing it. A will just list off, like a grocery list, different problems that you have. <laughs> Things that are going on in your life. You don't need to go into the history because my parents... No. It's just, this is... In one sentence, you just list off whatever problems you have. Now, as you're listing it off, after each thing you say, your partner, B, will say, everything is changing. So you share a problem, they say everything is changing. Okay? A minute and a half. Let's go. Okay. All right. Acknowledge your partner. And are you ready? I think, Mona, you, you want them to switch, right? You know what's coming next. B, this is your turn. Go ahead Share and your switch. <laughs>
All right. Okay, acknowledge your partner. <laughs> Bring your awareness back to the front. Give your partner a hand. Yes. I had never seen such smiles, laughter, joy, enthusiasm on the part of people sharing their problems. <laughs> what came up for you when you heard your partner say, everything is changing? Possibility? What else? Release. Temporary. It's going to be okay gonna in the be. sense it's going to be temp it's temporary. So when we see that, looking back, self-study at our life, we've seen that all the changes, we've gone through them, we've survived, we've thrived. For sure, what's coming up next will also survive and thrive. Isn't it? Another change, another thing you can do is bring up a sense of valor. Have you survived all your changes? We wouldn't be here right now if we hadn't. So that already takes care of the negative. <laughs> this sense of valor, this courage like a lion, that come what may, I can handle it. And you already have been. So say with confidence to the person next to you, I got this. Say it like you mean it one more time to somebody else. <laughs> now, would you like a third way of handling change? So this I learned from my guru, my mentor, Sri Sri Ravi Shankarji, and it's to bring up the wow factor in life. Now, when we're woke, no one says awake anymore. Have you noticed that? Okay, so we're woke. And we live life with a sense of awe, a sense of astonishment. When we don't bring up that sense of wonder, that sense of awe, then life becomes mechanical. We miss this creation which is steeped in mystery, which is steeped in possibilities. How many of you are planning to watch the playoffs today? Would it be any fun, would it be any fun to watch the games if you already knew the outcome? No. Life loses its joy when we know the results. So this wow factor opens up possibilities in us. So Sri Sri showed us this breathing technique to bring up the wow factor inside of us. Yeah, if someone's already saying, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, ready? So just watch me first. And you have to compete with me in terms of how big your eyes get when you're doing this. So it's like this. <gasps> wow. <gasps> that astonishment. Oops. Ready? You felt it though, right? Okay. <gasps> okay. So now... <laughs> That's why we bought these chairs. I feel like I'm in a baby carriage. Being <laughs> okay, ready? <gasps> with joy, with enthusiasm. Okay, now on the count of three, we'll all do it. And let's do it for good measure three times. And really make your eyes bigger and make the expression even more lively as you continue. So we'll start at 100%. Ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Wow! <laughs> wow! <laughs> wow! If people were questioning if we were a cult before they're sure, <laughs> sure we were, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, 
know there are only two kinds of cults in the world. Happy people and miserable people. <laughs> and we know where we fall in, right? <laughs> There's a fourth way. <coughs> Faith, trust, having trust in your own destiny. You know, I can get through this, just having this sense that everything, and we've seen this in our life, have we not? Doesn't everything just work out for the best? Then why sit there and worry when it's happening? You know, worry to me, it's like chewing gum that's lost its flavor. <laughs> It serves no purpose. <laughs> so just sen the sense of everything that's happening, everything that will happen, everything will always be for the best. Whatever's best for me and for the universe will happen. And again, that has genuine meaning when we've done the work to understand that there is a part of us that is certain. Otherwise, this just becomes, you know, lip service. But to bring genuine meaning to uncertainty means that you and I are continuously refining our skill set through meditation, through our spiritual practice, with bringing home the idea that what I am connected to is undeniable and everlasting. That's, that's what we're talking about in terms of embodiment. So my question to you is, where are you in that embodiment? And that embodiment is not a, a, a one-stop shop. It's a continuous practice for the rest of the days that we have on this planet. That practice of connecting to that which is certain, which then carries us through, and, and as you have so beautifully described, the actual joy experience in the uncertainty. Remember when we were in the retreat center in Boone and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, I've shared this with you before, was speaking and he so beautifully said, the number one problem in our world today is stress. Stress is attributable to our relationship with uncertainty. When we grow worried about our uncertainty or even worse, when we try to manage uncertainty, we become stressed, we become anxious. And he said, I have the cure. And how many people were there? That, like thousands, 2,000 maybe? Thousands. Yeah. Our capacity in that hall is 5,000. And everyone stopped breathing and they leaned in. <laughs> and he said, the answer is contained within one word. Perhaps. I will gain more certainty if I take that job in Philadelphia. Perhaps. I will gain more sense of self. I will feel better if I leave this job and take this thing. Perhaps. And it was just one of the most profound moments for me because that, that defines our relationship with uncertainty, right? Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> You can stay on the council. <laughs> Love that. Love that. <laughs> and so, uh, probably one of the most fundamental skills is through getting still and quiet. Would you help us maybe with some uh, meditative practice? Absolutely. Today? And you know, meditation is vital for cleaning the slate of our mind. Because meditation brings us to a non judgmental space. And then. We're free. We have all these impressions that we collect. I like this, I don't like this, and it's not going the way I thought it would go, and yes. And meditation just wipes it off. And meditation is that which puts us in touch with that non-changing self inside. So shall we do something right now? Let's keep our feet on the floor our hands in our lap. You can let go of anything in your lap. You can put your purses down or whatever. And let's keep our palms facing the ceiling. And let's close our eyes. 
Let's take a long breath in. And let's breathe out through the mouth, making this sound. Ha. Ah. Once more, let's breathe in. Ha. Ah. And this time with their mouth closed, breathe in. And silently breathe out internally. Let's take our mind back to when we were a six-month-old child without much effort. Lying in our crib, looking at our mother's eyes or guardian's eyes, looking at our fingers as if for the first time. Seeing colors, red, blue, green. Just eating and sleeping, that's all your life is right now. You're growing. You're two years old. Playing with your toys, moving about. You're growing. You're five years old, playing with friends. You're growing. You're 10 years old. You have new toys, new friends. You're growing. You're 16 years old. Recall all those things that happened to you when you were 16. You're 20 years old. If you're not yet 20, imagine yourself getting older. You're 30 years old. All those things that bothered you when you were 16 no longer bother you now. You're 40 years old. You have a better sense of who you are, are feeling more relaxed in life, more comfortable with yourself. You're 50 years old. Children whom you could hold in your arms yesterday have also grown and are starting lives of their own. You're 60 years old. The body's changing, but the mind is still very sharp. You're 70 years old, walking by the ocean, breathing in the fragrance of the salty spray. You're 80 years old, sitting in a comfortable chair, You've done all that you wanted to in life. You're happy, content. There's nothing left to be done. Take a breath in. And let go. Let's imagine ourselves as a medical doctor going to the hospital, treating patients. And now let's imagine ourselves as a homemaker 
taking care of the family, carrying on the routine at home. Now we're a consultant, traveling, attending meetings. So what? Let's imagine ourselves as European, as Scandinavian. Let's imagine ourselves as South African. as Vietnamese. Imagine speaking the language. What we've just done is rotated our memory. And we've seen though thoughts may change, experiences may change, the body may change. Something inside remains the same. Something inside remains untouched, ever pure. We are that unchanging self inside. Let's take a deep breath in and slowly breathe out. And when you feel comfortable, let us gently start opening our eyes. Hi, I'm David Alt, and I simply want to say thanks. Thanks for taking the time to watch our broadcast here at Spiritual Living Center of Atlanta. We have a vision, and that vision is to reawaken all to their spiritual magnificence. And one of the ways that we are able to do that is through this very medium of broadcasting. So if you got anything out of this, if you felt in any way inspired or if something spoke to you directly, then I extend an invitation to you to become a part of our family by donating. And there are many ways in order for you to be able to do that. One is to simply go to our website at slca.com and there you will find all different kinds of prompts that will help you support what it is that we are doing here in Atlanta. One way is to become a pledger. That means that you decide on a monthly basis that you are going to help us with this vision. Another way is to donate through our management system called Fellowship One, another through PayPal, and another even easier way is on your cell phone. You can do what's called Text to Tithe, and that number is 404-796-7030. Again, thank you so much for your support, and I invite you to come back weekly to see what it is that we're up to. Blessings.